everyone. This is Alfari, and I want to welcome you back to a continuation of this video series on debunking Islamic claims that Muhammad, the Muhammad of Islam, did exist in the seventh century in Arabia. With me here to continue with this deep dive into each one of those claims. So far, we looked at 11. Today, we're going to look at number 12, meaning those alleged claims is no other than Dr. J. Smith. Dr. J., welcome back. Thank you. And what you've just said bears reminding. Remember what people, this is what we're asking. We're not suggesting there was no Muhammad. What we're asking is the Muhammad of Islam. That's the Muhammad we're looking at. Does that Muhammad exist? What are we talking about? The Muhammad who has to live in Arabia, has to live in the Hijaz, that's the central part of Arabia where Mecca and Medina is, has to have received the Quran between 610 and 632, has to also have called himself a Muslim and be wrong to the religion of Islam. That's the Muhammad we're talking about. The Muhammad of Arabia of the seventh century, who is the one that received the Quran and lived in Mecca. That, unless you can find those four things, that Muhammad in those in that area with that book and with that nomenclature, if you can find that Muhammad, then we'll agree with you. But so far, everything we're looking at, and I just want to make this really clear. We're not saying there's no Muhammad in the 7th century. No, we would never say it. There's lots of Muhammads in the 7th century. My name is Jay. There's lots of Jays here in the 21st century. That's not what we're claiming. We're saying the Muhammad of Islam, your Muhammad, with that book, in that place, and at that time, prove to us that that Muhammad exists. So far, everything you've come up with, 11 of the areas that you've come up with, has them in the wrong place, doing the wrong thing. <laughs> and also at the wrong time. So you can see this is this is makes our job so easy because you are the ones that make the claim he existed. You're the ones that have to prove it. You're the ones that have to place him at the right place at the right time doing the right thing. As we've done with Jesus Christ, we're demanding that of you. And so far, we've, you've now given us 11 references, 11 proofs that you claim are proofs. And in every case, they've been able to, we've been able to debunk them just by reading the text just by understanding that this name is very clear, it's very important, it's very popular. It's the name that, that the title that is given to both Jesus and also the Exilarchs, the Jewish Exilarchs and the Christian Jesus, both of them referring to the Messiah is yet to come in the seventh century. So we're still striving to find that Muhammad in that area of Arabia uh, who received the Quran, who was a Muslim and was a progenitor of this this great religion called Islam. We're going to go to number 12 now, and this is one of the ones that you claim is a shutdown case because it's so clear that it comes from our territory, from our people. These are the Egyptian Coptic cops who are in Egypt today that can prove that Muhammad exists, and this is known as the Ashtanami letter. Yeah, so once you, uh, you and I talked about it a couple of times in the past. Once you give our viewers just an overview of what do we mean by the Ashtanami letter, what is that? Oh, it's a it's a well known letter that uh, that exists today. You can go see it. It's in uh, Saint uh, Saint Catherine's Monastery there in Egypt in the Sinai Peninsula, which Egypt controls. Uh, there's monks that have been there for millennia. Uh, this is a well known monastery. It's at, at it's it's where they believe uh, Sinai was, where Moses went up to get the 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 the, uh, the, the Ten, Ten Commandments. Commandments yeah. And that's, that's where they, the, the cops have always believed he did. And so this monastery is there to commemorate that. But what has happened is that over the centuries, this monastery had become a repository of many famous manuscripts. The monastery. The monastery itself. And yeah. so there are still hundreds of, monas of manuscripts that are still there housed in their library. Uh, that's where Tischendorf went when he found the Sinaiticus. That's right. The most famous of the three metropolitan codices. He, in the 1800s, he was traveling through there and he saw this, according to what tradition tells us, I'm not sure how true this is, whether or not it was in a waste paper basket, but when he went into the manuscript section, he saw this manuscript there in the waste paper basket ready to be burned so that the monks could keep warm. And when he pulled it out, he, he noticed that the Greek that was on it was majuscule. Majuscule is the... Uh, it's a type of Greek that was used with capital letters with no demarcation of one word to another. It just all was all in one line, so it's hard to know what you're reading. And so in the fourth century, they start introducing minuscule, and this was not. This was 
manuscript. And he said, this must be a fourth century or earlier manuscript. And so he asked if he could borrow it. And they uh, they said, yes, you can have it. They were going to burn it anyways. So he brought it back to Britain and they sent it up to St. Peter's, uh, St. Petersburg uh, in Russia, and they dated it to the fourth century, around 325, 350, early, mid uh, fourth century. And that is now in the British Library at the Riblack Gallery. You, you can see it if, well, when it's on display. So that is why St. Catherine's Monastery is famous. But also, it's also famous for this Ashtonomy letter. Uh, and amongst many other things, it's also the Sinaiticus, uh, the Codex Sinaiticus 121 is also there, which is the earliest translation of the New Testament into Arabic, which has Jesus as Yeshua, not as Issa, proving that, and this was written, I think, in, uh, let me see, I've got the 868, so yes, that's the late 9th century. century. Yeah. In the late 9th century, they were still referring in Arabic to Jesus as Yeshua. So that's also in St. Catherine's Monastery. Now, the monks have come up with this document. And so the Muslims are claiming, Jay, this is your material. These are your monks. These are your cops. Look and see what it says. So let's go back to the slides and let's take a look. And let's start with the, the last slide that we looked at in the last episode, which are the four to five references to the name of Muhammad in the 7th to 8th century. And we notice that every one of these names the all of the 11 only five of them actually have the reference of to muhammad in them and they're all in uh, place them in gaza jerusalem damascus or hira way too far north uh, this is uh, nothing more than references to the praise so we go now to the asana my letter number 12. let's look at the slide there is a picture of it on the right notice it's uh, it's a very archaic piece of literature it is in Arabic, but it's also in other languages too. It's not just in Ar uh, Arabic. It's it's written in. Uh, you'll see. We will we'll be getting into it. But it's uh, so supposedly written by Muhammad or Ali to the monks of Saint Kath in Saint Catherine's Monastery, which would is existence. It would have been in existence in the seventh century, promising them protection and other privileges. So it's promising the Christians, the monks. This protection. That's why the monks like it. They want it because this is something that's going to protect them. Well, well, wait a minute. I thought Muhammad was an illiterate person. Okay, but this is written by Ali, is what they say. Oh. However, Muhammad put his handprint to there. So you notice yeah, I... that not the gold one. Look at the, the the black one. That's supposedly Muhammad's hand. Wow. So he that was his signature. He couldn't read write, so he just put his signature on it by putting his handprint on it. And how did he print his hand with the nails upward? I don't understand it. Uh, are you really going to really get into this? Is that important right now? It's important that we get into the script of itself. I want to look well, at Well, I'm the... trying to show people that you have to ask logical questions. That's not logical. Who okay. cares about whether or not... I, it's okay. probably... He, they just traced it out and then they just uh, blackened it in afterwards. Yeah, probably. So here we go. Le here are many problems with it. And re the, the problems, you just need to look at the document. Just read it. There's one you brought up. I haven't thought of that one about whether his fingers are up or not. But here's the first problem. It, and let's take a look at the slides. It has many historical anachronisms. What am I talking about? Number one, it's dated to 625. That's the date that it's on it. It's dated to that. Yet the traditions say no, letter, no letters were sent until 628. And only those were sent to Medina, not outside of Medina. This is way up in the north, a thousand miles further north, way over in Egypt in the Sinai Peninsula. So that's a problem in and of itself. Number two, there are 47 writings listed by Ibn Sa'd in 845, in the mid 9th century, and this is not one of them. If this is such an important writing from Muhammad himself, why did they not mention it? Well, obviously possibly because it didn't exist that early. Number three, look on the right side. Do you see the minaret there? There's a minaret pictured there. That's right, yeah. Now, minarets were not created until the 9th century, and they were not used until the 11th century. So already you can see we can push it back beyond the 11th century, all right? Okay, that's number three. What about number four? Number four, the word sultan is referred to but was not used until Muhammad Ghazna, who was from 998 to 1030, that's 350 years later. So now we can push it even further back to the 11th century that this had to come back after the 11th century because there was no reference to Sultan earlier than that. All right? That's number five, right? Or no, no, that's number four. Now we come to number five, and it refers to mosques. Mosques are mentioned, yet there are no mosques in Egypt until 641. Remember, they weren't there. Egypt was not under their control until that time. And the jizya rates were not decided by Christians. They were decided by the Muslims themselves. So that is a misnomer. So you got coming and going. There's all kinds of problem. That's number five. Number six, 
it refers to the Malak Mukara, which is the angel of proximity. That is first referred to, found in a Sufi writing by a guy named Mutnabi in 968. So that's the 10th century. That's 340 years much later. So in every case, this is much, much too late. And then we get to the idea that it was written in not only in Arabic, it's also written in Christian, Egyptian, and medieval Arabic. So the Arabic that's there is differentiated. There's many different hands writing this document from different parts of the Arab world. None of them are the right Arabic. These are Nabataean Aramaic Arabic. They're not Sabaic Arabic, which would have been, if it was Muhammad living in Hijaz, he would have used Sabaic Arabic. They got the wrong Arabic. Of course, whoever wrote this document would have known something as specific of that. We now know that today. And then the Dimilas. It talks about the Dimilas. Hold on, but these were actually introduced centuries later. Yet they're referred to in this document about repairing churches and forced marriages. There is no Dimi laws that early. So we can at least say this is something time after the 11th century. Conclusion, and this is what they're now concluding. Most scholars conclude this today. And here is put the conclusion up. In short, the monks at St. Catherine's Monastery in the 16th century, and this is a real problem in the 16th century, we're talking about the 1500s, needed protection from the marauding Muslims all around them. They were the ones that created this document. So they forged this letter and then added Muhammad's name and his handprint to give it authority in order to safeguard their monastery. Thus, it's an 800-year-old fraud. And almost every scholar today would suggest that that's the case just because of looking at the internal content. It's a fraud. Yeah, I just want to point to something on the slide itself. Uh, at least someone uh, picks on it. Uh, the angel proximity in Arabic is Malak Muqarrab. So there is just a slight typo. The H needs to be a B uh, because somebody's going to pick on that. So That's my fine. typo. That's me. I'm Arabian. I've yeah. been known to de destroy my Arabic. But I just want him to know that we know that we noticed it. You noticed it. I didn't notice it. Thank yeah. goodness you're here. Yeah, no problem. So what are we going to talk about next time? We're going to go into the Constitution of Medina, which is concerned to Muslims as their, as their uh, narrative, their paradigm of how Islam should really be. And they always like the Constitution of Medina. This is the, this is the document that Muhammad supposedly introduced in 624, 625, about two years after he had moved there, uh, after the Hijrah. Uh, so they love this document. So we're going to uh, introduce that. And they say, this is another proof of Muhammad because he was the one that created this document. And that's number 13 in number the 13. list of the 16. 13 is not a lucky number. So we'll see if this one will work for them. All right. Well, everybody, hope you're enjoying uh, all of these claims and the way we have presented to you how they could be refuted easily just by looking at them. And of course, we're so thankful that Dr. J took the time to even summarize for you some of the highlights of what is wrong with using those kind of claims or these quotations to support the standard Islamic narrative. We're not denying that such quotations did exist or even the people who said them. We're just looking at it and saying it doesn't really tell us anything about a person by the name of Muhammad who is the Muhammad of Islam. That's the main thing that we're trying to highlight. Until next episode, this is Al-Fadi. God bless. Thanks for watching. Please like, subscribe, share, and comment. And ring the bell so you will be notified when we release new content. Our mission is to reach Muslims with the gospel of Jesus Christ and help Christians engage with their Muslim neighbors. If you want to join us in this life-changing work, please support us on patreon.com forward slash International or just click on the link below.